있으십니까? c'è qualcuno là fuori? c'è qualcuno là fuori? benvenuti al Christian Podcast il seizanezo basi ma radio That's right, my friends. My name is Beto Gudinho. Welcome to the Christian Podcast. Today we have an amazing guest and we're going to talk about what freedom means. I have this big question, like what is the biggest crisis in America today? What are the tenets of freedom? Is freedom the enemy of freedom? What is the worst that can happen to a nation is it the corruption of the best and uh like the russian proverb used to say when it happens to you you know it's true so today we have a super special guest that i'm about to introduce to you guys so i want to invite you if you're listening right now just you no know, give it a like give this podcast a share and send us your comments because we want to hear from you all right so if you guys are ready Here we go. All right, so this is Beto, the avatar of Beto Gudinho. And you guys know the real Beto Gudinho is having meetings right now. He's doing other stuff. But I'm here with you guys on the internet and with our special guest today. Oz Guinness. Oz, are you there? I'm here and happy to be with you, Beto. Awesome. All right, Oz. Well, you're the author of this book I have right here in my hands and many other books, but this is one of your latest called The Magna Carta of Humanity, Sinai's Revolutionary Faith and the Future of Freedom. The Future of Freedom. I love that. And I think, you know, today's topic is the biggest crisis in America today. And I think that's, that's related a little bit to freedom. And before I say, you know, my first question, I just want to introduce you to the audience. And I have it right here. Oz Guinness was born in China and educated in England. He's the author or editor of 35 books. A frequent speaker and prominent social critic, he has addressed audiences worldwide. A passionate advocate of freedom of religion and conscience for people of all faiths and none. He was the lead drafter for both the Williamsburg Charter and the Global Charter of Conscience. Is that accurate, Oz? Is that who you are? Or how would you say so. who you are? <laughs> yeah, no, that's accurate. <laughs> awesome. Oz, what does it mean to be a social critic? Like, what does that look like for you? And why did you become one? Well, it's just a straightforward term for people who comment on what's happening today. Now, if you know a bit of my story, I grew up in World War II in China as a boy in incredible times with war, violence, famine. And then when I was a seven-year-old until I was 10, I was in the capital of the Chinese Revolution and the beginning of the reign of terror. So I only say that because it left me with an incredible sense. We need to understand the times in which we're living to be responsible and to really engage ourselves. And those of us who are Christians, followers of Jesus, you know, we're called to read the signs of the times. And as Paul says about King David, to serve God's purpose in our generation. So I've always tried to make that one of my aims, to see what's going on, to really be responsible in living today. Mm, love it. Being responsible in living today and When I was reading your book, I mean, it's there's so much history in it. It's so good. I highly recommend to people that love, you know, about history and and it kind of gives us gives you a really in depth look at the Western world and Western civilization and what is Western civilization and why is it at the the place where it's at right now. And I would like to start this off um, us with this question: like, is America? at war with itself? 
Absolutely, I'm afraid. It's no secret. I mean, I'm living in Washington, D.C., and everyone admits America is as deeply divided today as at any moment since just before the Civil War. But of course, the question is why? Is it the social media? Is it responses to the former president? Is it the coastals, those of you in California and New York, over against the heartlanders and people in the South? Is it the populist, you know, Hillary Clinton's deplorables, over against the George Soros type borderless world advocates of a globalist world? My argument is that all those things are important, but not the real problem. Mm. The real problem is those who understand America and freedom from the perspective of the American Revolution and those who understand it from the perspective of the heirs of the French Revolution. Because better if you think of postmodernism and the sexual revolution, tribal politics and identity politics and cancel culture, critical race theory, all these things that are troubling us today, they are the heirs not of 1776, but of 1789 and the French Revolution, which was very different. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that I've learned from your book is that um, this really is almost like the legacy of postmodernism, which is which is uh, the French Revolution, right? And the Enlightenment. And I think right now, I mean, this is trickling down. And you describe it really well in your book to all aspects of of the American culture, right? It's it's happening in, in schools. It's happening in, in social media, in legacy media, in everywhere. And mm -hmm. Uh, I guess, what is the worst that can happen to a nation when this is happening, when America is at war with itself, what would be the worst that can happen? Well, there are two disastrous outcomes you can see today. One would be revolution. At the moment, you see the left-wing radicals in the uh, university and college world, in the press and the media sometimes, and in the world of Hollywood and entertainment, but they haven't won the whole culture. But they might. And I would say, looking at all the history of revolution, their left-wing revolutions never succeed, and the oppression never ends. So beware. The other thing that's happening today that's very unfortunate, America is a republic, but a democratic republic. A democracy, of course, is the self-government of the people. But what we've seen in the last 50 years is a big swing from democracy, the rule of the people, to oligarchy, the rule of a few, the sort of tyranny of expertise. And so you've got a ruling class, the people who call ordinary people deplorables, over against the rule. That's very unfortunate. That's the death of the republic, as we can see it. So I hope neither of those come true. Mm. Yeah, and in in many of your your passages or chapters on your book, you say the worst that can happen is the corruption of the best, and and you also say this that there's a Russian proverb that reads, "When it happens to you, you'll know it's true." And I, I guess one of the bigger concepts of 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 the whole book is that America, it's I mean they call it the American experiment, right? And this this whole idea of having freedom. And I love how you say there's there's two bookends of history, authoritarian um, on one end and anarchy on the other end. And could you like explain us a little bit more what this means, like the bookends of history? Well, authoritarianism is all order and control, no freedom. Anarchy is all freedom and chaos and no order. Anarchy is unlivable. The war of all against all, as Thomas Hobbes says. So people who are in danger of anarchy hunger for an authority for order, control, putting things right. And so you see a swing from anarchy to the other extreme. Now, you have both of those in the prehistory of the world in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. The Tower of Babel on one side and the flood conditions on the other side. And the Lord's way, God's way, his new way was Abraham, Moses, the Exodus, leading down to our Lord himself. 
what you might call the way of ordered freedom, freedom within a framework, the government. And that's what the US copied originally. So Americans don't realize the idea of constitution, we the people and all that, comes from the Hebrew, the Jewish Old Testament notion of covenant. And there are key things like the consent of the government comes from Exodus or the separation of powers, checks and balances, the idea of limiting power because of the potential for the abuse of power. That comes from Exodus and Deuteronomy. So America owes its best to the Bible. Mm. But Americans have forgotten that and sadly focused only on the contradiction, which was horrendous at the beginning, which was slavery. Mm. Yeah, so in, in a sense, I guess, what I'm getting from, from reading your book is that America and really Western civilization is the legacy of, of Hebrew scripture, is the legacy almost like it, it became Judeo-Christianity and that mm -hmm. kind of formed our, our notion of what the West would look like for many centuries. And right now it, it seems like, like this, this uh, crisis or this this tension or almost like trying to pull down and, and make it collapse. It, it feels like it's a lot of center on, I mean, you mentioned in the book, right? Like you mentioned things like critical race theory and uh, you mentioned postmodernism, like we said before. And so these ideas, even, even Marxism and communism and socialism, like things like that, um, that are pulling against this freedom. And I think, so if there's a, like, how do we balance this, this tension between not becoming too authoritarian or anarchist, uh, but living in that tension of the middle? Like, um, what, is, what is freedom in that sense? You know, is freedom attainable? Because if, if you're in between those and you either pull to one side or the other, what is freedom? Go back better, though, to where you started about the West. You know, the Roman world was Mediterranean, and it was influenced by the Greeks and the Romans above all. But when Europe was one, that was what really made the Western world. And that was through the gospel. So the West has Greek roots and the West has Roman roots, for example, governance and central heating, among other things. But the principal roots of the West are the scriptures, the Jewish and Christian faiths. And today, though, we're a cut flower civilization as many people have tried to cut off those roots. And as you know, flowers in a vase don't last as long as flowers in the ground. So the Western world is very close to the end as it declines. Now you mentioned freedom. The big divide in freedom is, is freedom the permission to do what you like or the power to do what you ought? In other words, does it need a basis? Does it need a framework? So there are many of our Americans today say libertarians, don't tread on me, or not in my backyard, you don't. It's purely negative. Do what you like, so long as you're not harming anyone else. Now, that doesn't work out very well, and the biblical view is very different. It's the power to do what you want. Freedom is the ability to be who we are, to think as we think, to speak as we speak, and so on, freedom of speech. But in the Christian view, to be free, you need to be set free. Or, you know, the great Jewish philosopher Isaiah Berlin puts it, there's a negative freedom and a positive freedom. So negative freedom is becoming free from everything that's restricting you. It might be a bully, it might be a a violent spouse, it might be a colonial dictator, anything that's constricting your freedom, you need to be freed from. But that's only half of freedom. That's liberation, but not full liberty. Positive freedom is freedom to be who you are, but to be who you are, you need to know the truth of who you are. So positive freedom requires truth. You think of the famous words of Jesus, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And yet in a postmodern world in America, many people say that God is dead and that there is no truth. Well, how do you have freedom? 
And the fact is, on the radical left, there is no truth, and all you have left is power. And that's the danger of so much of the left-wing politics. Mm. Wow. So, yeah, freedom has has the liberty side of freedom, the 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 liberating and then the other one is kind of like like choosing right and uh wow this is so good because i mean with freedom isn't complacency inevitable you talk about in your book about passing it on like the idea of educating children and and passing it on on to the next generation but it also seems you know even you start at, at somewhere in the book in the in the first chapter you said what does he say about America that, that is the biggest nation with uh, um, drug abuse and drug um, rehabilitation, right? And here in the society that's supposed to be the most free, you're the one that it's also encountering like the most freedom to almost like to corrupt yourself. And, and now you're trapped, right? Now you're in a, in a real cell or jail. And so how do we pass it on because freedom once you live this freedom is complacency inevitable yeah we, we the challenge in the old testament the word comes again and again remember mm. remember in other words you need history and you need schooling but i love the fact you may have noticed i quote the rabbis what did moses talk about the night of the passover 430 years of freedom and tonight They're going free. He doesn't mention freedom. And amazingly, they're going to the promised land, the promised land of milk and honey. He never mentions it. Three times Moses talks about children. Why? If any project lasts longer than a single generation, you need schools and you need history. Because the story we tell to our children is the key to our identity and continuity, handing it on from generation to generation. Now, that means with both faith and freedom, you've got to hand it on. Well, now you look at that in the, in the past in America, that was done mostly in public schools through what was called civic education. But at the end of the 1960s, civic education was thrown out. And then you had Howard Zinn's view of American history. And then more recently, you have the 1619 Project, which is a kind of Marxist view of history. Well, that is literally suicidal for the American Republic because freedom, properly understood, is not being handed on. The sad thing is something similar happens in the church when faith is not handed on. You'll have a generation that no longer believes. Yeah, and I love this idea of remember that you, you said it's written again and again in, in scripture. And I mean, as we talk about even scripture, I think, you know, if I could play devil's advocate mm. a little bit, oh. right? It seems like, um, you know, even you said when, when we talk about this idea maybe of sin in the world, uh, that's a preacher's word, right? That's That's not a word that, we utilize in the day-to-day -day life. And uh, you talk about repentance and this idea of like a spiritual uh, homecoming and a physical uh, coming back. And it's a new chance at the heart, but it also seems like if you're not remembering, how do you even get to repentance? And even when you, the things you're trying to remember are, are different ideals than those of freedom, then you're going to end up remembering something not worth remembering mm -hmm. in a sense, right? Um, so how do we, I mean, you said the secret of survival is schooling. So what is, how do we turn this around? What is the role of education in a society if if the education that we're passing on, it's, it's not provoking freedom? Well, remember, I'm not American. I'm a European visitor to this Me country. Me neither. <laughs> Admirer of America. Um, but America cannot survive if the current views of education continue. There's got to be a restoration of good civic education. But the same is true in the church. 
unless faith is handed on from family to family and generations or in schools, the faith will be in trouble. And clearly, with Generation Z, it often is in trouble. So there's got to be a restoration. Now, in church, the preacher, the pastor, the minister should be the one who's calling people back to the word Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. But of course, that's not true out in the wider society. And in Israel, you had the prophets. The prophets were the spokesmen on behalf of the covenant, challenging their people when they strayed and when they went a different way and bringing them back. We take, for instance, Elijah on Mount Carmel. Do you want to follow Baal or God? You've got to choose. You can't sit on the fence. And Americans have got to decide today, are they going to follow the ways of the French Revolution and the radical left or return to the ways of the American Revolution, which at their best were rooted in Scripture and putting right the definite wrongs like slavery and racism and so on. So we need Christians as prophetic voices in culture, challenging people, pointing out where their ideas lead to and pointing back to a better way. Mm, wow, I love I love that idea of prophecy because it sounds if you're not a Christian, prophecy might sound uh, weird or it might sound maybe esoteric. Uh, but really, the idea of of a prophecy in the Bible, it's this is where it's going to end, right? It's almost like semiotics playing to hey, these are the signs that I'm reading. Like you said at the beginning, we need to understand the times, and then it's almost like you can forecast what's coming so it's it's really not that foreign but uh in this in this idea of you know playing devil's advocate this is what kind of strikes me that let's say you're not a christian it almost seems like there can be no understanding of freedom apart from understanding god well yes that's true in a very profound sense better if you ask What's the grounds of freedom? Now, if you ask that to a Babylonian way, way back, they would say it's all in your stars. We're not free. If you ask that to a Greek, you take, say, the great famous play of Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. Behind everything is fate. If you ask it to an Indian, behind everything is karma. But what's amazing, you would think that modern people all believe in a strong foundation of freedom. They don't. If you read all the great atheists, Bertrand Russell, B.F. Watson, uh, B.F. Skinner, rather, J.B. Watson, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, all the new atheists, we are not free. Freedom is a fiction. We're determined by our genes or our chemistry or our childhood background. We just have to find the causation to show that we're determined. Amazingly, the Jewish and Christian view in the Bible is the almost unique view of a foundation for freedom. So Christians should be the champions and defenders of freedom. We're not afraid of it. We're proud of it. God has created us in his image, and we are significant. He's sovereign. He's free to do whatever he likes, despite any resistance and any opposition. That's sovereign freedom. We're not sovereign, but we are significant. We make genuine choices. We're creative. And it's challenging and wonderful to think the greatest thing we do creatively is create ourselves. For better or worse, by our good or bad choices, we are creating the person we are becoming. Mm -hmm. In other words, freedom is a very biblical idea. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. Because, yeah. Uh Every every choice we take, it's either creating our future or almost like stopping it, right? And even in your book, you, you talk about like, uh, for example, like suicide, right? For some people, they might see that as like the ultimate freedom that, uh, you know, I, I can do whatever with my life, even end it, right? Yeah. And it seems like freedom. How is, I mean, even in that, like, how is that not real freedom, Well, of course, it's freedom. You can choose to kill yourself, but that's the end of yourself. And you can see that freedom like that is literally nihilistic. It leads to nothing, death, extinction. But that's the individual tragedy. If you think of a nation, there's a link between faith 
and fertility. Hmm. So the more secular people are, the more you notice that the replacement rate in birth is below the replacement rate. And many of the European nations, and now increasingly parts of America, are not replacing enough to continue. Whereas take, say, the Jews. Secular Jews have a birth rate below replacement. As you move across to the Orthodox Jews with a strong faith, it's well above the replacement level. So there's a strong link, even with fertility, between faith, however dark the times are, we trust in God, and having children in the future is terrific. You know, my parents had three of us, boys, in China, and we lived in a place in which We were caught between three armies. The Japanese had killed 17 million in their invasion. And then we had the communist army on the other side and the nationalist army on the third side. And we were caught in a terrible famine at one stage in which 5 million died in three months. You know, but with all of that, including later revolution and so on, never once did I see my parents with anything but a quiet trust in God. The circumstances were horrendous. Never seen anything worse in my life. But my father used to say, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in every situation. Have faith in God. Have no fear. And that's the Christian faith, because we know ultimately it's going to work out for the good. Wow, that's that's so incredible. And as I was reading the book, you even mentioned that um, I think two of your siblings died in this. Was it in during yeah, this sister, famine? An older brother, an older brother died, and my younger brother died. I nearly died. Uh, you know, when we left the little town in which we were living, my mother was a surgeon, and they brought the gospel and medicine to China. But when we got out, I was too small to know. I was only three at this stage there were 10 million refugees on the road. And there was cannibalism, people selling their children for an evening meal, wow. horrendous circumstances and appalling suffering. So my parents saw the very worst of the 20th century in the white of the eye. Then we moved to Nanking, which is where in 1937-38, the rape of Nanking had taken place. And if you know anything about the rape of Nanking, it's probably the most, not the largest massacre, only, I say, only 300,000 killed. But in a way that was so brutal, even the Nazis who were there were shaken by what they saw in the Japanese soldiers. Mm. Wow. Wow, Oz. I mean, this is incredible because the uh, all these all this history from not too long ago, from, from a century ago. I mean, not even, we're, we're at the beginning of the 21st century. Not even uh, a century, I'm not that old, Beto. <laughs> yeah, but it, it seems like, you know, there's this idea that um, we're supposed to learn from history so we don't repeat the same mistakes of the past. And, and at some point, you know, I, I ask myself, like, are we living unprecedented times or is history just repeating itself? Right. And, and when you mention like all this famine and rape and, uh, you know, people killing each other, I mean, is, is that just repeating itself in, in different ways? Well, you know, the great German philosopher Hegel used to say the one lesson we learn from history is that people don't learn the lesson from history. Wow. And, you know, our English poet laureate, he used to say a nation without history is like a person with Alzheimer's. And part of the sorrow living in this country now is that young Americans have no interest in history. And sadly, many of them don't read books either. In other words, they get everything from the internet and they deal in the social media with fast impulses, emotional responses. This is very dangerous. We need people who read books because books carry a lot of wisdom, but we need people who really understand history. Now, you look at the Bible, you know, the pagans in the time of Israel had festivals, and so did the Jews. But all the pagan festivals were festivals of nature, say the springtime or the harvest time or whatever. 
But Israel changed that. They had the same time of the year, but they all celebrated history, such as the Passover or the giving, uh, giving of the Torah from Mount Sinai or the Festival of Booths celebrating their journey through the vulnerability of the wilderness and so on. In other words, the Jews switched from nature to history. And that common refrain, remember, remember, remember. And as the rabbi said, when you celebrated, say the Passover, you were as if you were there. In other words, you could have been centuries later, but you were as if you were there and you felt like what it was like to go out from Egypt with Moses. And that should be true of Christians. And you think of wonderful songs like, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Mm. You know, we should have a living sense of history so we can appreciate Moses or Abraham and Elijah and Isaiah and above all our Lord and the Apostle Paul and Peter and so on. We need a living sense of history. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good, Oz. And again, like your book, you, you mentioned like these five revolutions and you say one of them is, is the revolution that started at Sinai with the Exodus, right? With, with people being liberated out of Egypt and how even God called for the first time a nation versus an individual and how that shaped humanity for the rest of times. And mm -hmm. I guess... I guess what I'm where I would like to almost like start wrapping this up is with this idea that I mean freedom without God it's you, you can't even understand real freedom without God but I I feel like all the time I want to almost like give give the benefit of the doubt to people who are skeptic or people who who feel like you know they might call it religion or you know, the, the opioid of, of society or whatever. And and I feel like a part of me understands that as, as yeah, I mean, how, how can I trust in this, in this freedom from this God or this history from this Jesus or this people of Israel, right? Like for, for a, lot of, a lot of people that doesn't make sense. But you said, um, you said it's so cool in your book. You said the only place where God is not is in the heart and in consciousness. And I feel like that's precisely what's happening to maybe a skeptics, right? Well, he's not gonna, he's, he's, he's giving you so much freedom in a sense to choose that he's, he's everywhere except in the heart and in consciousness. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, if you think, if God makes us free and he is everywhere and all powerful, we'd have no freedom. So his freedom has a built-in self-limitation. Again, as the rabbi said, there's one place, oh, put it another way. One rabbi said, is God everywhere? And his students said, of course, piously, of course. And the rabbi said, no, he's not in your heart unless you welcome him in. And of course, that's the same idea you have in Revelation, where Jesus says, behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking. And there's a famous painting by Holman Hunt in Oxford and St. Paul's Cathedral called The Light of the World. And Jesus is knocking at the door. And what's striking, there's no handle on the outside of the door. It has to be opened from the inside. In other words, the one place where we're all finally free to say yes or no, whatever we want to do, is in our hearts. And no dictator no cruise missiles, no secret police can ever invade our hearts, and even the Lord doesn't. Roger Williams used to say, God does not rape the conscience. And that's why we have faith that is voluntary, based on the dictates of conscience. So the final freedom, the heart of freedom, is the freedom of the heart. Hmm. So it's exactly right. We need to think it through beginning with our own choices, growing from our own hearts. But of course, hearts can produce good, hearts can produce bad. And we've got to make sure what's coming out. Some of us know we need to be set free to be free. Mm, wow, set free to be free. <laughs> That's so good. Um, Oz, I, I have two, two last questions um, around this idea. And 
and let's see how we can you know whatever you'll you'll come up with but uh, one is like what is this idea of the voice of god and also in the book you said something about um i think it was an american you know father uh, that said something like truth is not self evident no there's there's a saying that says truth we know these truths to be self evident but then i think it was a rabbi that said um well truth is not self evident uh, so how it, it, with this with this idea if it's not self evident how do we help people find the image of god in themselves or the voice of god in themselves like one would be what is the voice of god or what is the image of god and if it's not self evident how do we help people find it well it was jefferson who said we hold these truths to be self evident and he was saying so within a broadly christian and jewish world view where that makes sense but under modern secular presuppositions that makes no sense at all now better have me on for another time and we can discuss i've got a book coming out in january called the great quest in other words how do people who think come to a faith that's rational and responsible i think one can describe it carefully but i wouldn't don't want to put it in a sentence but i would say you know socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living if he's right in other words are people thinking enough caring enough to think through the meaning of life many people aren't and i'd like to set out maybe another time if you'd have me on a way how we can think through the meaning of life so that we have an examined life in that sense and that's where you have real meaning so much of modern life if you really think about it is meaningless mm. and that's the tragedy today wow a meaningless life is the tragedy today and i think this this helps me understand the biggest crisis in america today and and i guess i would like to end on on something hopeful us what would be your i know I, even in your book you said you know I, i'm not making forecasts and and things like that but if you could say what is your big hope for america uh what would it be well i try to be realistic look reality in the white of the eye but always hopeful and i am hopeful because if you look at the full biblical truths of who the lord is and in the light of that human beings made in the image of god there's no higher view the solid view of truth a powerful view of words and a lot of american life has to start with the reformation of words which through tweets and so on are appalling today go on down the line the biblical view of freedom of justice and peace and so on now i would argue these are the once and future key to freedom So the secular views today are literally bankrupt. We haven't time to go into it, but it's only these biblical views that point a way forward for humanity. So what a world we're in, with Chinese of totalitarianism emerging, with singularity and transhumanism not far away. Titanic questions are raised about the meaning of life, the meaning of human life, and so on. And I would argue that solid answers are in the Bible for those of us who are Jews and followers of Jesus. And so I'm a person of tremendous hope if we each explore these and commit ourselves to them and become champions and defenders of them in the public square. Mm, so good. I love I love hope and I love this idea. I always say hope is the future. Ask thank you so much for being on the show and like you said You know we got to do this again and hopefully you know when you write your your next book we can set up an appointment. Thank you so much for being here. Would you like to point people to a specific place if they want to find out more about your work? Well, you can probably the best place is osginis.com, my little website. Awesome. But thank, thank you, you so you much. Better. Awesome. Have a good one, Os. Thanks.
Ibrahim Iman. La speranza è il futuro.